Welcome back to the Forensic Focus podcast. I'm Krista Miller here with my co-host, Cy Biles. And this week, we're with Steve Slater, head of digital forensics at Devon and Cornwall Police in the United Kingdom, to talk about how his team is implementing the rape and serious sexual offense known as RASO portion of the National Police Chiefs Council Digital Forensic Science Strategy. Welcome, Steve. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> it's a pleasure. So, um, so you and I first connected back in March. Um, you tweeted about reviewing the RASO changes with your team. Um, so before we get into more of the meat of the implementation process, I wanted to talk a little bit about the rationale for these changes. Um, on the one hand, having um, the victims themselves, um, who I think almost universally across internationally really, um, have expressed frustration, difficulty trusting law enforcement's ability to help them. And on the other cases like RV Allen, where exonerating digital evidence wasn't properly disclosed to defense and nearly sent an innocent man to prison. So as, as you've been implementing these changes, how do you see them balancing this notion of trust but verify? So assisting the victims at such a difficult time, um, but also doing the due diligence to verify their claims. Yeah, um, okay, that's, that's a, a big old question yeah. there. So, <laughs> I know. Uh, it's quite a big piece for men to end. So, of course, the digital forensics only plays um, a small piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Of course. Um, now, it was a result of the uh, prosecution rate in the UK dropping, I think, below 3% uh, of rape and serious sexual assaults, yeah. um, which uh, initiated a joint action plan uh, review across the criminal justice system and policing. And there were multiple things that were affecting the um, output and the, the success rate. Um, and that, that ranged from how the police on the front line deal with uh, victims of these horrific crimes, mm -hmm. uh, how the criminal justice system, CPS as a whole, um, supported victims, and also how we uh, handle their digital devices. So for us, it was about... Um, that evolution of uh, from on the back of the ICO report, really, that a victim is a victim. Um, we, we were very traditional in, in the way we approach digital evidence, uh, traditionally with the high tech crime units. Uh, digital forensics is very set in a process, you know, the old ACPO principles and the way we do things. Mm -hmm. So all devices, we took a forensic copy, a bit by bit copy, we were examining that data. Um, but quite rightly, the ICO uh, and the, the protection groups around victims said, well, you know, this isn't correct. We, we have no legal right to access uh, a victim or witness's device and take everything. When you consider GDPR, um, you know, human rights and, and people's privacy rights, we shouldn't be taking all that data. So our part of the journey is really updating our processes and our um, stops and our accreditation, our, our standard operating procedures, how we approach the victim. Uh, we need to make sure it's a, a very focused examination. Um, we're only taking the data that's consented to, um, and we want to do that as quickly as possible. Uh, a victim is a victim. They, they've been for a highly horrific, traumatic incident. And um, the last thing we should be doing is taking away their digital device for a day, two days, three days or longer to take it into our system, do a full forensic examination and then report on just a fraction of that data and how we retain the data and all the other aspects that come into it. Mm -hmm. So our RASO vans, the, the national project headed up by the Forensic Capability Network, was all around, OK, how can we turn this around and flip it on its head, almost like a blank canvas. Um, but there's several aspects to it, such as making sure it's the right staff at the, the victim's location to do the examination first time every time. Uh, so it's not necessarily a kiosk approach, which is more automated and frontline with frontline officers because kiosks aren't always successful and mm. you know, um, a lot of those phones will get submitted onto DFU uh, if, the, if the kiosk does fail. So of course that adds a delay for a victim. So we wanted to make sure um, it was highly trained staff, the right staff with the right equipment and the right tools, the right training and expertise, uh, downloading that device straight away, first time, every time. 
Um, so the van, the principle is we will go to the uh, victim location, either a home address or a, a local police station. With the um, data protection notices in place, uh, we'll have an informed consent from that victim to access the data of relevance. Um, and that the evolution, the ongoing thing as well, is we'll always make sure we're keeping our tools up to date. It, we're using the right tools. We're, we're constantly testing the market um, to make sure that the tools we're using will do something called data slicing, which I'm sure you've heard of with other tools, where we can just access that specific data there and then, and then the victim can have their um, device back straight away. I mean, how are you addressing the 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 fact that you know a i mean technology is is moving on in the sense that you know there's a million different social networks and a new one will pop up tomorrow um mm. and also you know you're doing a, a, a sort of a triage process uh, on this device and saying well these are the important things how are you managing the risk of actually missing missing something because of this triage i mean i understand the implications of going to a, a victim and, and and the reasoning behind it but obviously there's a a, a, a corollary to that which is that if you're only looking at part of the data, the exculpatory evidence might be in the other part of the data or, you know, yeah. other victims or anything else. But, you know, there's there's this potential for missing things. How, how are you managing that within um, within your processes and procedures? So for a victim, um, we don't really look at it as a triage process. Um, so because it has to be con uh, informed consent, the victim will tell us it is a WhatsApp message between myself and the suspect uh, in the last week, in the last six months. And so it, it's very focused examination. So um, for a victim or witness, we can only go and access the data that they consent to. Um, so there is the risk that obviously a, a victim may um, delete material or not want us to see all the material, but that is the victim-centric approach. Um, under the ICO uh, guidelines and GDPR, we can only take the data that the victim consents to, so we won't take anything else. Uh, with regards to suspects, um, yeah, we, we, we do deploy triage. We don't use uh, the VASO bands for uh, triage. We've got uh, dedicated triage locations across the forces, uh, which frontline officers use. So we use various tools for that with the frontline officers, but predominantly there's a, a, a search pack created. Um, so if it's a child abuse investigation, it will have known hash values uh, of the indecent images. It will have known um, keywords, known locations. And also the search packs are very um, intelligent. So they'll go on and they'll look at the most recent files first. They'll look at the, the most common user locations or internet locations. Um, but it has to be, you know, technology is only part of the solution. That has to be coupled with uh, an investigator's mindset to actually think, okay, well, have I got everything I, I should be getting? Um, you know, how does that correlate with the intelligence in the case? Because uh, we certainly do get cases where um, triage is negative, but the officer just isn't quite happy, so the case will still be submitted. Um, and we've got very strict protocols in place as well. Um, so triage can only be used for um, cases where we could identify the evidence, for example. So we've got a quite good gatekeeping process in place to review the jobs and the exhibits and the um, exhibit type or data types that are being sought for. Um, a simple example would be if it's a um, live abuse case, first generation images, uh, we wouldn't put that through a triage process. We would potentially examine all the exhibits in that case because we know that the uh, images, movies or chat wouldn't be uh, present in our databases. So I think, yeah, it has to be a very, um, you know, a, a team approach. Uh, the technology aids, uh, but it, it's really down to the OIC and their understanding of the case and the intelligence, what a victim or suspect is telling them um, and what other intelligence is available to help them make that informed decision. So is there a feedback loop that you can take from 
a suspect device that says, okay, well, actually, I found, um, let's say, WhatsApp messages that the victim hadn't disclosed. Can you then go back through a, a feedback loop and go to your victim and say, you know, you didn't give us consent to have a look at this? Would you mind? Is that does that happen, or or is that sort of informed consent at the point of reporting or the point of acquisition, the end of the sort of vic victim uh, side of forensics on those devices? Um, so it, at the start of the case, it would be informed consent. We would only take the data that the victim uh, consents to. As the case uh, progresses, if, if more intelligence came to light or more evidence came to light from other devices, um, that would be obviously something the officer would take back to the victim. So yes, certainly we could uh, request that that device is examined further. Um, but then, it, of course, it's in the realms of, is it still consent? Uh, if it's a victim, they are still the victim. We, we, it's a very victim-centric approach. Um, but, of course, it could turn into uh, the victim becomes a suspect in a, a, in a different type of scenario. And, of course, that exhibit may be seized. Uh, but that, that's very rare, if I'm honest. Um, and, and, no, yeah. I, I mean, I understand that. I mean, the cases that we hear about are people attempting to pervert the course of justice and, you know, hiding other things. And, and, and therefore, you know, those cases would be the ones where this feedback loop would be valuable. So if it exists, that's 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 obviously critical. But no, I mean, the idea that the victim is um, is the one that we are taking care of in a given yeah. in a given scenario yeah. should absolutely stand. I just want, you know, I'm trying to, to figure out how we by doing this we create the risk that the victim will be believed regardless of what they say and we have to mitigate that by saying well okay there will be a feedback if if something is found that's exculpatory on uh, on the suspect's devices that potentially uh, make this a different uh, a different case so no that's brilliant thank you mm. and of course it doesn't replace traditional policing methods at all does it the digital no. evidence it's it's still a lot of, uh, I think, gut instincts with an officer sometimes as to what's right and wrong and where, where the investigation needs to go. Um, I think, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think gut feel is, is incredibly important. I mean, if, even from a digital forensic perspective, you're looking yeah. at the device and you're like, mm, well, this doesn't feel quite right. I'm going to, I'm going to go for a bit further. Um, yeah. I feel but like I it, think, can, it I can backfire too, though, you know, that, that gut instinct, because I mean, you can, you can just as easily have bias honestly that that also uh, masquerades as gut instinct right so yeah and and in fact to a certain extent that's what the rasso changes sure, are yeah enforcing is a, is is a gut bias towards the victim which again i'm not i'm not against this yeah, i think yeah. that they need to be taken very seriously and i think that there is a historical um aspect of perhaps dismissing these cases uh, a little too quickly in some in some scenarios but um but yeah, we need to, to put in those checks and balances to make sure that that, that sort of thing doesn't happen. So it's, I mean, it sounds like a lot has been involved over the last few months in terms of implementation. Um, what's, is, is there, are you still rolling it out? Is it pretty much um, um, a done deal at this point? Have you, um, what kind of feedback are you getting from the team? Um, so from the team, uh, you know, we, we, there's certainly a capacity issue uh, that the, the staff are highlighting because uh, it is a change process for them yeah. as well. Uh, and I think you, know, you need to look wider at the, the sort of evolution of high-tech crime. Um, so in the early days of high-tech crime, we were out and about on a lot of warrants with our child protection teams and uh, early morning and late nights, um, where sort of nationally as demand has increased because the, the plethora of digital devices out there now and the 90% of crimes that involve a digital uh, footprint has just overwhelmed us really. So with the creation of cyber and digital teams, uh, we, we've sort of dropped away from the frontline um, examination of devices and attending warrants and providing assistance. So at the moment we, we focusing certainly on the CPD of our staff. Um, we've got a lot of new staff uh, in our units who've never been out on warrants. Mm -hmm. So of course we, we've got to make sure um, that they're supported and their CPD around them actually going out. It, you know, it's not a warrant. It's not a, a risky situation we're talking about here. This is um, a, a compliant victim 
uh, where they, we're going to support. Um, but what's, it's also interesting how uh, the CPD is, is unfolding with uh, the teams to understand the victim-centered approach. Um, everything we do in the police world, or well, any world really, is all about the victim uh, and, and how we're supporting a victim. Um, but of course, it's that traditional digital forensics approach. I need to take a full forensic copy just in case there's other evidence needed or defense need to see something. You know, it's a very um, thorough process. So we're doing a lot of work around um, our CPD of, of what the new legislation and the um, you know, College of Policing APP guidance and everything is actually pointing that it is a selective ICO type um, examination. Um, but no, we haven't deployed them as yet. We've mm. got one that is uh, due to deploy uh, potentially next week now um, because the vans only arrived uh, when we got all four by June, uh, so in the last month. So, of course, there's a bit of work that our, our workshop teams do with just checking the vans, uh, you know, making them safe and all the kit for the local force. Uh, we've then got to test and validate all our equipment. Mm -hmm. um, so all the kit that came from the FCN as well, because these are mobile, mobile labs. Um, they're not just for RASO. Uh, we can examine, triage, uh, acquire any digital device uh, at a scene. Mm -hmm. So even though they're primarily focused at RASO victims, they, they, they do cover any digital device, which, it, which is phenomenal. It's great to have that um, asset with the teams. But of course, behind the scenes, then you, you've, we've got to validate the kit, make sure we're happy with it within our processes, uh, make sure all our SOPs are up to date, our standard operating procedures with accreditation, um, and just you know the whole process and uh, tool uh, development is in place as well so um, the teams are eager to go uh, it, it's a great process and also uh, the way I look at it as well is this is a great um, welfare opportunity for our teams uh, because we've certainly evolved in the DFE world to be really sat behind the scenes um, you know staff doing invaluable work uh, day in day out just potentially looking at some of the most horrific stuff continually as well mm -hmm. Um, so to, to building a sort of shift rotor where for a week, a couple of weeks, however the teams want to run it, but they can be out on the road. Um, they can come in in the morning, pick up the van, make sure the kit's ready, and then they're out and about driving around. It takes them away from sat there at a screen uh, for eight hours a day, uh, looking at horrific stuff, but to actually get out and uh, you know network with the officers, um, obviously supporting victims and, and taking that expertise to the front line as well. So, yeah, we're, we're still in the process of rolling out um, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of changes we're going to have to make. Um, it's going to be an, an evolution. We're critically aware of that. So we're keeping an eye, eye on all the tools that are out there as well. Um, have we got the right tools? Um, what's coming on the market? Uh, we've got a lot of projects running with different organizations uh, to just sort of look at, okay, how can we evolve? What pilots can we run? Um, even to the extent of getting better tools on the front line for victims and witnesses. Do we need a DFU specialist in every single case? Um, it could be that there's, there's a, a tool out there where a frontline officer, as soon as they have that interaction with the victim um, or a witness, they can take that data straight away because uh, it's an informed, consensual process of live data. If it's anything more complex, um, you know, location, system data or deleted data, that's when it would then need to come back to us in the DFU. Have you found that, you know, you were saying that this is you going back out into the field again, and, I, you know, I think that's fantastic, but have you found that with the withdrawal into the DFUs that the officers on the front line, the OICs, have actually lost touch with what DFUs are capable of, either in the sense that they've watched too many episodes of Midsummer Murders and think we can solve everything, <laughs> or in the sense that they actually have no idea what we're capable of doing now. Um, I mean, you were saying that you want that the guys will get to go out and interact again, and uh, that seems like an opportunity to bring that knowledge back. But have you actually noticed it 
slide over time? Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. So we certainly still keep CPD in place with the officers. So we'll um, attend training days, um, team events in, in CID, PPE world. Um, so that's still in place. But I, I don't think we'll ever get away from um, that that sort of officer who wants to do the right thing for the right reasons without actually understanding what they're doing. Um, we've, we've always um, had it where, you know, everybody's got a mobile phone in their pocket. So, of course, everybody's an expert in how a mobile phone works. Um, and I hear that so many times across so many police forces, all suffering from the same issue. So, um, yeah, I, th I think we will always have those situations where we, we need to step in and support an officer more in certain cases. There's always key officers, officers who are regularly involved in digital evidence from the PPU world who, who really get it, really understand it. Um, and it's, we were talking about earlier, you know, you get those barristers as well who really get it, the ones who do the same types of cases over and over again and really understands that specialism. Um, so I think um, if, to be frank, I think, yeah, there isn't enough CPD for officers out there um, and I was really reassured to see how the FCN and the College of Policing were addressing that to put better CPD out to officers. And they've um, completely shaken up the um, induction process of new officers into policing as well. And there are elements of digital training in there as well now. Um, cyber teams and DMIs are out there on the front line. They're, they're very well um, placed with the links into the specialist teams not just DFU, it could be SPOC or AMPR teams uh, behind the scenes and providing that specialism into an SIO and providing that single point of contact themselves uh, between the specialist teams and an investigation team. So I, I certainly think it's better than it's, it's ever been before, but is it ever going to be good enough? And that that's the challenge, isn't it, with technology? Every, something's always changing. You know, we've got ring doorbells now, the Internet of Things vehicles, um, which, of course, 10 years ago we didn't. Um, and in another 10 years, there'll be something else that we're, we're having to just make sure that we're, we're keeping um, officers up to date with and, and our knowledge with uh, up to date with. But, of course, we're, we're always one step behind um, because that's the nature of the beast. We don't go uh, and develop our skills in something that isn't being used um, illegally yeah so uh, yeah it's, it's always an evolution it is an interesting question definitely i um i had wondered myself about um how the new procedures um everything you're describing had been received actually by the victims but it sounds like it's still kind of too early to tell yeah it is it is at the moment um and certainly some of the reports suggest that um you know, victims don't want to engage uh, with the police um, in a lot of cases anyway, but not through um, the fact that their phone is going to be taken away. It could be a third party report um, or, you know, just the, the victim feels it's the right thing to do to report to the police, but they don't want to get involved in a criminal investigation. Yeah. So it is a very complex uh, crime to investigate anyway. Um, but I'm sure... Uh, you know, the, with the hundreds of devices we get through the doors already that come into the DFU, and we already offer an immediate turnaround service in all our DFUs anyway. But this process will just take away the travel time um, of an officer having to take the phone to a DFU, mm -hmm. wait for it to be examined, take it back. We're, we're going to obviously shave hours off of that, if not a couple of days in some cases. Um, so in all those cases, I'm, I'm sure the victim would be... Um, feel more reassured because you know using our own empathy and looking at it ourselves how would we feel if somebody said i'm taking away your mobile phone for the day or a couple of days well you're one lifeline course, maybe to your support network right absolutely yeah. that that's exactly the thing isn't it? it it's your support network your family your friends it could be the social networks the you know dating apps all those things that you know, in the old days, we used to say, um, if somebody was being bullied online, don't go on that website. <laughs> right. You know, the, the, and of course, it's how we evolve and understand technology. You can't tell somebody to stay away from it because it, it, 
you know, it's that thing that follows you, isn't it? And there's more, a lot more psychological understanding nowadays. So just being able to ensure that the victim isn't left without their device is a massive step forward in my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, just a, a curiosity question, that, and again, feel free to answer this one, but, you know, the the willingness to go and um, report something like this to the police is is uh, that there is a historic issue with regard to things like uh, representation. So, you know, there's a lot of male police officers and a, mm -hmm. uh, a female going into a into a station and attempting to report <laughs> something like this is, is an issue. And also, you know, representation of ethnic diversity yeah. or um, or... or perceived gender or or any of the other uh things where people feel unrepresented in your um in your own sort of the staff that you're sending out what's your um ratio on representation like is it a a good mix or are <laughs> my experience of the uh of the forensics industry unfortunately is about 90 percent male um um i'd say we're running at about 70 to 80 percent male um and, and you are right, you know, we used high tech crime was always a male dominated environment historically. Um, and it was it was only men who used to apply uh, for, the, for the DFU role. Um, but, it, you know, I'm really pleased to see that that's changed massively in the last 10 years. Uh, we've got um, well, we've got about three or four um, DFU managers who are female, for example. Um, we've got. Uh, a lot of uh, our, actually, and there's, there's quite a chunk of our female um, officers are the mobile phone examiners coming through the door. So I think just, you know, society's changed, isn't it? Technology was always, uh, you know, the nerdy, geeky thing was always a boys thing, wasn't it? Um, whereas nowadays, um, you know, women are getting more interested in, in those careers and that type of environment as well, which is really good to see. Um, and also it's the type of material we found. Um, I do recall uh, back in, it was probably about 2008, 2009, um, we did have a, a, a female applicant into the high-tech crime unit. And as soon as we started talking, you know, and she was successful through the process. She was our third candidate. As soon as we then started going into more detail about the work and what it involves, um, she withdrew her application because she didn't want to sit there and look at that type of material. So I think society as a whole has changed, hasn't it, in just how we um, look at it and how we understand it. And certainly our support processes are better. Um, you know, we, with the mandatory counselling we have in place for our staff every six months dealing with this type of material, but we've also got uh, buddy systems in place, peer reviews in place, manager one-to-ones, so we've completely encapsulated the, the, these environments now with an understanding that it's okay to talk about this stuff and it's okay to have times when you, you don't feel okay or you're upset by a job. Um, and it's almost that uh, permission from um, you know, the managers and the structure and the policing to say to the staff that if, if one of your colleagues is upset, stop work and go and have a coffee and, and have a break. Um, so yeah, we're getting better at being okay to not be okay. Um, yeah. I still think we haven't got it completely right, um, and you know it's it's sometimes a balance uh, with demands and pressures where everybody's feeling it. Yeah. But it's certainly a better place today than it's ever been. I do agree. Wonderful. I'm really pleased to hear that. Mm. Um, how, how did you find it over the pandemic in, in, in that regard? Were you able to still work together as a team and get that level of support? Or did it become lots of this, <laughs> forgive me, but the, the, the Zoom stuff where, you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're trying to read micro micro gestures across, um, you know, well, probably to Hobbit be fair, in a local streets, region, yeah. probably only a couple of streets away, but, you know, still, still not face to face. Did yeah, the okay? pandemic... Yeah, it was a, an interesting time for us because uh, we, we just had a, a small uplift of uh, 22 staff. Uh, it sounds large, but across four forces, obviously 22 doesn't go that far. Um, but it was still a significant uplift um, and a really positive step forward for our DFUs uh, in, in combating um, increasing backlogs and the demands. Um, so we were recruiting right at the start of the pandemic. 
Um, so we, we managed to continue, which was really positive. Um, you know, a lot of hard work in the teams with the managers and the staff doing the recruitment and the testing of uh, candidates coming through the door. Um, but we still managed to recruit 22 staff throughout the pandemic. Um, our lab stayed open. Uh, it was a tricky one uh, because certainly with several meetings with like information assurance, for example, um, our, our rules and our procedures hadn't changed uh, and still haven't changed and won't change around security of evidence and exhibits and the data and GDPR, how we control data hasn't changed. So certainly we've seen, you know, the, uh, it's been a massive advancement for technology, uh, the pandemic, because of course all of a sudden teams were switched on and, you know, all these enabling tools became available on four systems. But of course, how we approach um, data and security hasn't changed. So unfortunately we can't take exhibits home. Um, we can't vet family members and friends coming in and out of an address. We, we, we can't put staff at risk by, you know, potentially making their home a fortress or putting sensitive data at their home address. Um, so, of course, our teams had to stay in, in the lab areas. Uh, we're still getting exhibits through the door. It's still sensitive data. It's still distressing data. Uh, still producing exhibits. So we had a lot of furniture moving around. Uh, we had a lot of screens going up. Um, and of course, it, it, it's, you know, for, for people like me, where I, I spent most of my time at home, I hated it. I hated not being in the team environment and, and around my colleagues and supporting them. And I wanted to get back in the office and back into the labs as soon as I could. But then for our staff, um, you know, they, they didn't want us there. You didn't want somebody else coming into your bubble where you, you're trying to stay safe. Um, and of course, they worked throughout it, putting... Um, you know, their own, not putting their own safety at risk because we had lots of safety controls in place, sanitizer and one-way systems, and we followed all the guidelines. But of course, it's still a worrying time, isn't it? You're still getting an exhibit through the door uh, that's just been taken from a victim or a suspect. It needs examining immediately. So we had to adopt our different processes where we would um, either treat that exhibit as uh, almost like a, a contamination thing where you know you're having to glove up and, and clean the exhibit examine the exhibit clean the equipment or we'd leave the exhibit um for 48 hours if we could um because the study showed that the virus would die on a classic surface within 48 hours and things like that so yeah it, it was a difficult time um certainly wouldn't want to go back to it as i don't think anybody else would <laughs> and of course <laughs> I think we're now suffering from the um, uh, the uh, yeah, the outcome of the pandemic. It's, it's trying to get back to normal and trying to um, reassure colleagues and you know that we still keep things safe, but we're trying to move back into a normal way of life again. One thing I was um, kind of curious about um, with regards to the pandemic, because I was um, I was re-reviewing RV Allen again um, before the podcast. And, it, you know, just it, it struck me that there were multiple failure points along that line. And, I, you know, I mean, that was in 2017 before the pandemic. And it made me wonder um, how that case might have been handled either during the pandemic, if there would be additional failure points introduced, or if um, the, the RASO changes and other um, changes that we've been talking about um, that have been going on in the UK would help to mitigate even what you're describing um, in terms of pandemic related challenges. Mm, yeah, that's an interesting one. Because um, certainly RV Allen, we've, we've learned from that. And I think officers have learned from that where um, you know, it, it is a complete digital evidence is only part of the um, investigations we were talking about earlier. Um, and certainly kiosk is only a part. Uh, I think RV Allen was all about the, the kiosk examination of a victim device, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, certainly from the cases we're involved in, an officer is um, more focused on the entire um you know the holistic view of the case so we will see the victim device as well as suspect devices mm -hmm. uh, coming through the door well i think uh, we're going to wrap it there steve thank you again for joining us on the forensic focus podcast today thank you very much for having me yeah
Thanks also to our listeners. You'll be able to find this recording and transcript along with more articles, information, and forums at www.forensicfocus.com. Stay safe and well.